why don't you just go forward? Um, okay, so I'm Dr. Emily Forbes. I'm one of the movement disorder neurologists here at the University of Colorado. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the genetics of Parkinson's disease. Uh, I received grant funding from the Michael J. Fox Foundation and from UCH grants. So sometimes when I suggest testing for um, genetic testing for PD in clinic, people are surprised as it's not commonly thought of as a genetic disease. And so why look at genetics? Well, 10 to 15% of people with Parkinson's disease have a genetic cause. And so that seems like a minority, but when you think about the 1 million people in the United States who are currently living with Parkinson's, that actually becomes a pretty substantial minority. Genetic testing gives you valuable information about yourself. So it can tell you why you got Parkinson's disease, and it can provide some information about prognosis. For example, some people with certain types of genetic mutations have an earlier onset with more cognitive changes, while other genetic forms have less cognitive impairment. Sorry, can you hear me? Other forms have less cognitive impairment. And the genetic testing gives us valuable information about Parkinson's disease. So whenever we discover a gene that's associated with Parkinson's disease, it gives us information about a pathway which is dysfunctional and leads to PD. And so this provides what we call a therapeutic target or a potential target for future treatments for PD. So let's take a little bit of a step back and talk about the history of genetics and Parkinson's. So this slide presents an early timeline of PD genetics. So Parkinson's was first described by Dr. Parkinson in 1817, and it wasn't until about 100 years later when Lewy bodies, which are the pathologic hallmark of PD, were discovered. And so that's what that image below shows. This is the abnormal aggregation of alpha synuclein within the cell, and that's what the arrow points to. Uh, as Dr. Puso had mentioned, levodopa wasn't utilized until the 1960s, but I'm gonna add one thing in between, which is in 1953, the uh, structure of DNA was determined by doctors Watson and Crick. And so that kind of started off the genetic error. After that, levodopa started to be utilized for people with Parkinson's disease. So I'm sure you're all very familiar with Cinemet. And it wasn't until the 1990s that genetics of Parkinson's disease really started to be worked out. So in 1990, an Italian family was identified as having a likely genetic cause of Parkinson's. And this was because the doctors and researchers working with them saw that multiple people in many generations were affected with PD and thought there has to be a genetic cause for this. So in 1997, the first mutation was discovered in that family. Um, it's the SNCA gene, which actually encodes for that protein alpha synuclein, which I had mentioned earlier as aggregating into Lewy bodies. So the next thing that scientists did was they looked at other people with Parkinson's disease and tried to find this SNCA gene in others, but they found it was absent. And so this was an early indication of the complexity of the genetics of Parkinson's disease. Now, by the late 1990s and early 2000s, other genes started to be identified. And so those include genes such as LERC2, which we now know is the second most common risk factor for PD genetics. In the 25 years since the initial genetic cause of Parkinson's was discovered, we now have more than 20 genes that we know are associated with PD. And so what this slide shows is there are numbers on the outside of a circle, numbered one to 22, and those represent our chromosomes. So that's how DNA is stored in our cells. Um, and you can see on the inside of that circle are different names of genes. And so these are the genes that are known to be associated with PD um, to some extent. Now, this isn't a comprehensive list because there are over 90 other candidate genes. So genes that we think are probably associated but scientists and researchers are still looking into what that association means. This is data from the Parkinson's Foundation's PD generation trial. And so some of you might be familiar with this. So this was a trial, or this is a trial that's ongoing, and it provides free genetic testing for people with Parkinson's. The goal is to better understand the genetic architecture in Parkinson's disease. And so this is new data that was just presented last month at the uh, Movement Disorder Society conference. And they found of the thousands of people that they tested, about 15% have a genetic cause. And you can see that on the image on the left. 
So most of those have one genetic change causing Parkinson's, and there are a few people who actually have two or more genetic variants. Now, if you look on the right, what they did with this data is they stratified it into high risk and low risk groups. High risk is something that they defined as people who had early onset Parkinson's, high risk ancestry, such as Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, or a first degree relative with Parkinson's disease. And so these, this group of people was thought of as having a higher risk to have a genetic Parkinson's. And actually close to 20% of these, this group did have a genetic cause. They also looked at those who were defined as low risk. So these are people who have later onset Parkinson's, who don't have high risk ancestry, and they don't have a first degree relative with PD. And even in this lower risk group, 10% of people were found to have a genetic cause. So what were the genes that we're looking at? So that study looked at seven different genes, but of course there are more than that. And so this graph here um, shows that of the many genes, there are different risk levels associated with them and different rates that they occur in the population. So some genes cause a small increased risk of developing PD. You can see these genes on the bottom right of this graph. These are genes that many people have um, many people are walking around in the general population with these, and, and most of them never go on to develop Parkinson's disease. Uh, there are also high-risk genes, and you can see these on the top left. So these are genes that are very rare. So most people don't have these genes, but if they do, they're high risk to cause Parkinson's disease. And one of those you might notice is the SNCA gene that we had talked about earlier. For the purposes of this talk, we're gonna focus a little bit more on GBA and LARC2. So these are the two most common risk factors for developing Parkinson's disease. And I kind of underline risk factors because if you have them, they only confer an increased risk. Most people who have either of these genes actually never develop Parkinson's. So GBA, the first risk gene, this encodes for the protein glucose reversidase. This mutation is present in about 2 to 30% of people with PD, and that's a pretty large range. And so most of the time, it's closer to that 2%. It's when we get into people who have a high-risk ancestry, for example, Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, that it can get closer to 30%. And a mutation in one GBA gene increases the chances of developing PD. So, but again, 70 to 90% of people with this gene mutation are walking around and never develop it. If somebody does have a GBA variant, there are a few things that we know about it. It often presents at an earlier age, so people might get Parkinson's symptoms earlier on. It often has more cognitive impairment and a higher risk of dementia. Hallucinations and REM sleep behavior disorder is more common, as are levodopa-induced dyskinesias. The other mutation we're talking about today that's a risk factor is called LARC2. So this is a leucine-rich repeat kinase 2. Mutations are pretty rare. About one to 2% of people with sporadic PD have it. It's a little bit higher in people with familial Parkinson's. Again, higher in certain high-risk populations. Now, while we know the other gene, the GBA gene, has certain associations like earlier onset or more cognitive impairment, LARC, people with LARC2 who have Parkinson's disease tend to look like people without genetic Parkinson's disease, so people who have just sporadic Parkinson's. Uh, and it's hard to tell the difference between LARC2 carriers and general Parkinson's. So say you were tested for genetics and you do have one of these or the other, one of the other genetic mutations that's associated. A lot of people wonder, what should I tell my family? Is there anything I can do to talk to my family about this? The first thing to note is if you have a family history of Parkinson's, there's always a small increased risk of developing PD. And so that goes, that stands whether you have a genetic mutation or not. The difficulty with genetic testing in PD is that having a mutation only increases the risk. It doesn't guarantee that you'll get symptoms. And so there are other factors like environmental factors or certain other regulatory elements in our genome that also contribute to risk. So if you have a family history of PD, but you have no symptoms, we generally recommend that you don't get genetic testing. Because if you have the gene, there's no guarantee that you'll ever develop Parkinson's. And what's more is if you don't have the gene, that's not a guarantee that you won't develop Parkinson's. Because remember, 85% of people with PD 
don't have a genetic cause. However, people with Parkinson's with genetic PD and non-genetic PD, as well as their family members, can still contribute to research. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the research trials that are going on. So universal therapy for Parkinson's disease is unlikely to be discovered, unfortunately. Levodopa is very helpful, as well as other dopamine replacement therapies are very helpful for symptoms, but they don't change the course of PD. And so a personalized medicine approach is likely to be needed to um, tailor treatment to people's specific mutations. A couple of trials that I'm gonna mention here. Propel is a trial for gene therapy where a constructed helper gene uh, that contains instructions for making a functional version of the GBA protein um, is being studied. And then Ambroxol is a compound that has been studied before in PD for both Parkinson's disease and Parkinson's disease dementia. It's found to be safe and further studies are pending. And in addition, there are numerous companies listed here which are interested in testing people with PD and in some cases, their family members. And so these are all great options if you're interested in research, um, whether it's you who has Parkinson's or someone in your family is interested in contributing as well. So one of the newer trials for LARP2 is this Luminaire study. So these are two sister studies. So one is the Luma study and one is the Lighthouse study. And it's looking at one group of people with LARC2 Parkinson's disease and another group of people with Parkinson's disease from all other causes. This is a new compound that they're trying to determine if treatment is safe and can slow down worsening of people with early stage Parkinson's disease. And so because they want very early stage PD, it's limited to those who have had two years or less um, of symptoms for the people with non-LARC2 PT, so with, without a genetic mutation in LARC2. Because LARC2 is so rare, if you do have LARC2 and interested in participating, they'll take people who have had PD for five years. Um, and so this is an oral medication, which is another exciting thing in the world of new drug development um, and can be taken up to once a day and the trial lasts several years. And so I just put some information about our research number if someone's interested in hearing more about this. And again, for LARC2, these sponsors are all interested in um, people with genetic Parkinson's disease. And so you're welcome to reach out to one of them as well if you'd like to contribute to research. So in summary, genetic causes of PD occur in about 15% of cases, with GBA and LARC2 being the most common genetic risk factors. And there's a huge acceleration in clinical trials for genetic forms of PD that provides hope for a disease-modifying therapy. And so what I'd like to leave you with is this kind of vision for the future where we can imagine a world where someone who's diagnosed with Parkinson's immediately gets genetic testing. And the 10 to 15% of people who do have a genetic cause are offered a personalized genetic treatment plan. What's more is that the 85 to 90% of people who don't have a genetic cause might also be able to benefit from therapies that target the abnormal gene pathway. And so that's kind of the hope that genetic testing provides for a future for disease-modifying therapy for PD. So with that, I'd like to thank you all. I think we're going on a break.